Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Free Marketeers blog slash podcast. This week, you're watching myself, Chris Hudson, along with Jacques, who you saw last week, and a new guest. We have Zakele here. I hope I pronounced that right. You guys know with us white guys, we struggle with these names. So, but luckily, <laughs> do, thanks yeah. very much for, for having such a simple, relatively simple name. Yeah. Um, Zakes, I thought we'd start with you. Um, just sort of an introductory sort of aspect for the viewers. And you'll be doing some back work for us here at the FMF. Um, you're a student at the moment. Could you just sort of give us an insight into your journey into libertarianism? Um, any particular books you read? Any authors? Um, did you have a Damascus moment that the voice of Murray Rothbard speak to you? Anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, as you have already said, it was like, hello, I'm Tembu, for everyone who's wondering what my surname may be. But I used to be a socialist uh, for a very long time, mm -hmm. actually. And my foray into libertarianism was due to Thomas Sowell okay. being one of the few, because I was also a race identity politician. So as I was researching black liberals, I came across Sowell and... Walter Williams mm -hmm. and Sowell's writing just spoke to me. The first ever liber libertarian slash liberal book I ever read was Basic Economics. Okay. And that was my Damascus book, <laughs> okay. if you were to call That's it that. That's a pretty good start, yeah. <laughs> it is, it <laughs> is. And it, it was inspired by me essentially researching market socialism and me trying to understand markets. And it just took me to economics and I stumbled on Thomas Sowell and the rest is just history. Because okay. After him, I then moved on to the Austrian school because the Chicago school has mathematics and I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> the Austrian school was the best really. And no. yeah, my rock, but though has to be my favorite writer, him and Bastiat. Well, I think one day we should do a, our own like Mount Rushmore's of libertarianism oh, yeah. and Sort of see who would be, you know, that that idea of like who's on your your Mount Rushmore. Oh, like they talk about yes, the Mount Rushmore yes. of like rugby or whatever. Oh, yes, we should do one where we definitely. we have that list. I think that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you probably put Rand at the top, but no, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> oh wow, well, thanks guys. Yeah, you can no. have like a little rock where you call about it. Name. Oh yeah, wow. maybe on the thanks. side, like something. a little pebble or something. The honorable mention. And then you throw the pebble into the water. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm never having these two on together because they're always going to gang up on me. <laughs> okay, viewers, we've got uh, two things we'll discuss uh, this week. Maybe three. We'll see how much time we have. Uh, one more thing that popped into my mind I'd like to run through. Um, so first of all, some of you might have read about the IMF's uh, warning or statement about and to South Africa. Um, this will be familiar to many of you. These sorts of thoughts will be familiar to many of you who read our articles and submissions. You are aware of the deteriorating economic situation in the country, um, you know, sort of some of the causes behind that. But basically, in this IMF uh, warning, they talked about the rising uh, debt to GDP ratio. I think it's at sort of 60% now. Uh, over and around 60 um, they talked about that. They talked about um, lack of skills, sort of skills shortage. And then they talked about the continued um, support of failing SOEs, which is a huge um, strain on the economy as well and on the government. Uh, guys, of those few things I mentioned, is there anything that you think maybe they should have added, included, anything that pops into your mind? For me, it was expropriation without compensation. I do think one of the ratings agencies, it might have been mm. Moody's or one of the others, did recently say we should drop that. But uh, yeah, um, I guess this, this shouldn't come as a surprise for the government. I mean, for us, it's obviously not a surprise. We think, look at other countries that have done these sorts of things and then drop them and how they've recovered yes. and how they improve their economies. South Africa is adopting almost all the wrong policies in every single aspect. Today is the deadline for submissions on the national health insurance. Mm. Um, that's another one that's going to wreck the economy if it's not wrecked by that time in any case, once it's implemented. So just your thoughts, maybe Jacques, firstly. Oh, well, I don't know. I think really they have any other issues that they need to add to that. Add to that. I just think that they need to emphasize it more. Mm. Just how detrimental, um, for instance, expropriation without compensation will be, especially right. with regards to fixed investment in this country mm -hmm. that you need. I mean, we've seen the decline in fi gross fixed capital formation or fixed investment, right. which is what you need to supply things to people yes. who need it, to want it. And I mean, we've seen this um, also with the decline of our construction sector. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that the IMF specifically just need to emphasize this more and more, whether they get accused of being neoliberal shills. Probably will. Well. <laughs> no, way, no matter what you say, or what you do, you'll get those accusations. So at some point, you should just stick yeah, to your guns. It should guns just or, be like water yeah. off a duck's back. Yeah. 
but yeah. yeah, true. I agree. I don't think they can add anything outside of what they said mm. to just echo Chuck's point. They just need to emphasize it much more. Also, especially expropriation without compensation. It just it, it, it happens to be the biggest threat we'll ever face right. because it'll undermine everything. Once you undermine property rights, there's no economy mm. to speak of because yeah. it just has this cascading effect mm -hmm. that will have very, very detrimental effects on our economy. But the SOEs, facts like me coming from Soweto, mm. I know this quite pertinently because right. currently a lot of people I know from my surrounding township are current, currently don't have electricity mm. because they haven't they haven't been able to pay. And ESCOM is trying to do something to recuperate those losses, but okay. the, the best way to deal with state-owned entities is just not to have them. No. Or if they do exist, they must exist in a market whereby they have competition so mm -hmm. that people can opt out of them. And I think if the IMF were to just emphasize the liberalization of the economy yeah. much more to the South African government, because our government seems to be moving towards nationalized and more centralized economy, yes. the one reflecting the national party government, mm -hmm. instead of moving to a more decentralized one, because one would think that we would have learned from the NP about the consequences of nationalizing mm -hmm. key sectors of the economy, but yes. we seem to have not learned, and yeah. the IMF essentially needs to emphasize that. I mean, yeah. the, the, the critique that they may possibly receive should be inconsequential at this point, mm -hmm. They should just stick to their guns, mm. really. Yeah, at some point, you, I mean, the critique is fine, I guess, in a healthy debate sort of thing, but mm. this is going to affect people on the ground. Um, like you talked about the fixed capital formation. So mm. if you have less of that, is that sort of, uh, will people see it in terms of fewer jobs being created, for example? Well, effectively, as I mean, think of fixed capital uh, is exactly what it says. It is capital you need to be used that it's fixed like a fixed asset, like a building or okay. whatever. And if there's literally less of that, where are you going to run your business from? Mm -hmm. it, that is that is the main gist of what right. fixed capital formation is. So, yeah, we'll see less jobs created. I mean, we, our industries, some of them are quite capital intensive, mm -hmm. others aren't. I mean, in the ones that are less capital intensive, you'll see more job losses. Right. Maybe even in, in not actual people losing their jobs, but the opportunity cost of what could have been. Okay. More jobs could have been created, mm -hmm. such as you can see the snowball effect. No. Yeah, and we see the the growing numbers of of unemployed people every year. We're over ten yeah, million now. Yeah, so million. next year, when we talk about this sort of thing again, don't be surprised when yet more people are added to that mm. ten million, which is obviously very unfortunate. But the blueprint is there in a way for the government. Um, it will require some sort of introspection and honesty. But if your concern is truly, as they say, the welfare of the people. You just have to bite the bullet at some point and take the swallow the the um, mm. the medicine. Yeah. Um, then moving on to our second one, and you touched on EWC, so this fits in quite well because we've been told by various parties and um, you know sort of academics and influencers in the <laughs> culture, writers, analysts, or radio personalities how mm. important land reform is to South Africa, even though it's I think nowhere near the most. Uh, the most well allocated item on the budget, um, but they keep telling us how important mm -hmm. it is. And they tell us that's why we're getting EWC because we have to give land back and that whole story. But in this particular situation, we have the traditional Khoisan leadership bill. Uh, now this bill gives traditional leaders and councils, they'll have the right to sign away co communities land in deals with mining companies, regardless of what those people in those communities agree to. They say they'll have sort of sessions and councils but I think it's simply um, yeah. ceremonial yeah, in a way. Yeah, They'll sort of browbeat. Um, no, just to, to try to appease the rule of law no. advocates, essentially. No, yeah. and it's a very uh, it's superficial a very, understanding yeah, of the rule of law. It's yeah. a very superficial understanding yeah. of the rule of law. Yeah. I, mean, all, I think all it's about is, okay, we do, as long as we adhere to the process, we can do whatever we want, right. which is just not true. Yes. Um, so on the one hand, we have government talking about reinforcing property rights um, with EWC, which is a contradiction in terms, but they, they say we need to we need to give the land back, we need to reform, we need to transform. Then on the other hand, they take away people's rights. Yeah, I see. Um, so just your your thoughts on that, maybe, because Jacques has talked yeah. a little bit. Um, what do you do? You think? Do you see any logic behind it? Don't you think this undercuts some of the under other other rhetoric that they've talked about rights? It does. And that kind of thing? It, it, it basically undermines everything. Oh, the entire argument that the proponents of expropriation by compensation are arguing for because the argument is that people do not own land and this bill is inherently gives ownership to, to an institution which is traditional councils and people still won't own land but now 
those, those institutions will essentially have the power to alienate people from land that they currently occupy without any due process. Due process being like semantic consultation doesn't count as that right. really. So right. it, undermi it undermines every argument that you try to make mm -hmm. for expropriation that compensation when you're going to turn around in the, in the other hand and essentially don't give people the land but give it to another version of a centralized authority right. which is the state and the, the problems with the bill are, are plentiful because it essentially seeks to define traditional leadership mm -hmm. through form of understand the form of understand alienations and one would think that the the the, the undercarried the under the, the, the undercurrent spirit of the, expropriation of that compensation is that essentially it's decolonial or working right. against about that. That's what we've been told at least. That's yeah. what we've been told at least, but the government then comes around and uses apart, apart, apartheid institutions to essentially try and argue for the mm. betterment of, mm -hmm. or, or for the betterment of the people they claim to be fighting for. Mm. And not only that, the advocates, people who actually live in the, in, in the rural areas, like in in communities like in the Eastern Cape, the, like the Madiba Crisis Committee, they actually were fighting against the passing of this bill mm -hmm. because it will give traditional leaders who have a vested interest yes. in the businesses, in the mining businesses, plus the ANC politicians who passed this bill mm -hmm. in essentially granting these mineral rights to foreign businesses. It will give them power without any form or without any form of check couple yeah. that with the traditional court bill which was also which is also due mm -hmm. to be signed by the president we may end up having people in the rural areas may end up not having even recourse to contest those decisions because mm -hmm. there will be a dual legal system essentially for people in rural areas and for people who don't live there yeah, it, yeah the, the problems with it are too plentiful mm -hmm. to actually yeah and it's been it. signed into law mm -hmm. so apparently it was on the 20th of november i think as far as i could tell from what i read um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's in a way it's replacing one. <laughs> yeah, you replace your one master with another master, no, like you no, talked about the apartheid. And we we bring this up a lot that a lot of policies being enacted now, NHI, EWC, this bill, for example, also prescribed assets. It simply it, it all takes as a principle that the state should be in charge of our lives, that the state should have this sort of power that it can dictate mm -hmm. to us where we should live, for example, what we can do with the rights we have over our land. Um, and we, we need to really buck this trend in South Africa. I guess it's been throughout our history. We've simply um, been subdued by different governments and different yeah, groups. We've yeah. never had, I don't think we've ever, we can say we've ever tried actual freedom in South Africa. Mm. I mean, the, regardless of what apartheid apologists will say, it was not freedom, it was a status system. It yes. was, if it wasn't socialism, it definitely bordered on it. Right. It was definitely fascist mm -hmm. in nature. It was definitely fascist with a lot of socialist aspects yeah. in it. Um, the ANC has a lot of socialist aspects in it, communist mm -hmm. aspects in it. And before that, we had we had some peaceful conquests. We had a lot of violent conquests. Yeah. I don't think we've ever adhered to the principle of the principles contained in the rule of law. We've mm -hmm. never had a healthy respect for property rights for for and just for liberty and libertarianism mm -hmm. in general. No. I don't think we've ever lived up to the ideal of liberty right. and freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised that these. These things continue cropping up and, and then the effects it'll have on people's lives. I mean, we try and warn people about this all the time, but yeah, you'll you'll see this work out in, in people's lives there. And to talk about transformation, I just want to touch on this sort of broader philosophical point. There's nothing radical about statism and state control in this sort of bill in giving in, in centralizing power. There's nothing truly radical. There's no radical economic transformation. Radical economic transformation would be giving rural women and men actual individual yes. property rights so they can decide yes. what they want to do with their property like yes. using it as collateral kind of thing which is why as people from the left every time especially in south africa they argue like this capitalist system is so exploitative like mm. the, the implication is that we currently have a semblance of a free market when we don't really mm -hmm. we, it's, it's relatively free but it could be even much more free yeah. and Especially one, if you would think of our history, one would think that liberty and individualism would be something that is more readily accepted because we've actually seen the results of collectivism mm. Mm. and mm. statism mm -hmm. in South Africa, and they are not quite pretty. But we seem to not have actually understood what the problem was with about it because I think the implication in the ANC parts passing these sort of bills and and regulations is that essentially. Uh, the state favoring one group of people over another group mm -hmm. of people is not wrong. It's just who those group of yeah. people mm -hmm. who are being yeah. favored are. And I believe that is a very, very anti 
freedom way mm. to think of the world yeah. basically because we essentially give credence to the ar arguments of the people who architected about it by saying essentially that the state should favor mm -hmm. people on mm. premises on race and yeah, arbitrary like things, precise, yeah. on arbitrary yeah. things yeah. when the state should never favor anyone under any circumstances yeah. and as I said, we seem to be moving towards the centralization of power through the state, whereas we should be giving much more power to civil society and mm -hmm. private individuals, essentially, because we've seen what the state does with power and it's not a very pretty thing. So yeah. rather human beings be left to their own devices to do as they deem fit. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's see now. Uh, maybe there'll be ways that, that um, civil society organizations such as Section 27 try to fight this sort of thing. Um, I yeah. hope so. Uh, yeah. Hopefully there'll be... Well, is there any, I mean, from your perspective, is there anything specific that crops up? Can it be, a, I mean, it's been assigned into law now, so I think, can it go to any particular mm, court or anything like that? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think one of the grounds that you should challenge this bill on in terms of its constitutionality, it's just the, oh, I'm, not, I'm honestly not really sure, no, on, sure. What, on what you can challenge that. I think the no. general aspect on which you should challenge this is the rule of law and that it it's delegated delegated lawmaking powers mm. and just way 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 too much discretion afforded to okay. people that aren't even publicly elected yeah so, yeah I mean, think about uh, i'd like to tie that to the the whole um, state capture phenomenon and corruption mm. uh the power that because the state has grown so big that not unelected officials and sort of contacts mm. with the government have enjoyed and they abuse that power the bigger the state is and the less accountable it is in this mm. sort of form the more the higher the, it's not always going to be corruption and abuse but you increase the chances exponentially mm -hmm. so that's our argument for decentralization individual ownership and control yes, yes. that sort of thing and i think what people need to realize when you speak about decentralization it is not decentralizing uh law making authority mm -hmm. from from legislator to ministers mm -hmm. to local MECs or maybe what we what we speak about in the context of the um decentralizing power and authority is that the individual should have control over the law. Right. I'm not saying, okay, so there should be more figures of authority yes, just from different right. levels of bureaucracy yeah. yeah. that should have that power. Yeah. That's not at all what we're saying. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And then just our last one um, that I'd like to finish on, um, Zakes, your first article uh, we had published this week. So yes, 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 I, yes, I just yes. wanted to get like the background on that, um, what your sort of research was and the, I guess oh, the yeah. topic. And yeah, I mean, you've only been here for a few days. And we're, <laughs> you're going to put the rest of us to shame. So oh, well, As I said, I, I have been to like doing legal research and any form of research concerning issues about liberty. So I was very interested when the Competition Commission released an inquiry, a report on an inquiry they did into the retail sector and essentially how exclusive agreements between uh, the big four retailers and property developers who own shopping malls act as a barrier to entry to other smaller competitors. Okay. And so the gist of the report was essentially saying that these validly concluded contracts, right, because uh, the retailers do not force the property developers to sign exclusive agreements and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The Commission of Inquiry essentially said that these validly concluded contracts were acted as a barrier to entry to other small yes, competitors. Yes, yes. And the implication of that is that each and every validly concluded contract will act as a barrier to entry because wow. they, those exist for every business. Mm. And that is what the commission inquiry, even though it did not say expressly, mm. implied in its logic by essentially saying that these contracts act as that. And there's not even, and the reasoning for them saying that is because smaller retailers cannot operate in shopping centers that mm -hmm. have signed these exclusive agreements. Mm -hmm. The irony of that is that they receive submissions from smaller retailers, yes. meaning that they do exist. They right. just essentially want them to exist under conditions that are preferable mm -hmm. to them. So it's regulation mm -hmm. for special interests, essentially, because there are these retailers who do not have a, as much of bigger revenue as the big four retail as the other big four who are essentially trying to get the government to regulate mm. their competition mm -hmm. out of competing with them they are trying to penalize these yep. big retailers for being successful because yep. that's what they are they were successful these these other smaller competitors can compete and also try to find other innovative ways to deliver their products mm. to customers because as I said, no rights were being violated by yes. these contracts yet. The Commission of Inquiry saw it fit to essentially recommend that these contracts not 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 be not be implemented and if new 
and licensing or lease agreements between retailers and shopping malls are to be signed. Exclusive agreements should not be included at all. It first that offers a recommendation, and if failure to comply with it by the retailers will most likely lead to the commission recommending a bill that will go to parliament that will essentially mandate that these agreements should not be legal. So, so talking about the government interfering in the way business tries to yeah. operate, I mean, this is yeah. the, a, a crystal clear example. Um, yeah, maybe it goes back to the, I guess, philosophical or meta concept of, of when when governments think businesses are too big. And I yeah. that in case, because who gets to decide what is too big? Um, who gets to decide what is too much, I don't know, yeah. profit or too successful? Look, if a business is huge, has a huge market cap, and most of it is thanks to cronyism and colluding with government, then sure, I don't have sympathy for the business. Right. But now, the business gets big because consumers speak with their wallets and yes. turn this business into this colossal corporate giant that it is. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, consumers turn around and say, oh, no, we can't have this. We can't have this. But you created this. Yes. You created not you as a no. single entity, but yeah. the collective result mm -hmm. was that the market yeah. deemed that, okay, this business should grow. Yeah, so the market right. responded. Yeah. The market responded. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's massively hypocritical for and the consumers who support this stuff. Yeah. But then I don't think like there's, there's a large majority of consumers who support this stuff because the majority of people do most of their shopping at these big four retailers because, as I said, sure. the, 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 the report even mentions it, that they get preferable mm. deals on, on their, on their, from their suppliers because they happen to be much more bigger. So from a consumer's perspective, I can pay much more less prices than I would of compared to a smaller retailer who, does, who doesn't get who doesn't get as as a preferable price who doesn't get preferable prices from their supplier compared to mm -hmm. a big retailer so there is an advantage that to be had from for, from my perspective as a consumer I could care less really I don't think consumers care about yeah. big business it's only special mm -hmm. interest groups yeah. who are funded by smaller competitors to these big businesses who care about them being big mm -hmm. and certainly the state whenever a, a certain industry or a certain business grows too big the state doesn't like it and will want a piece of whatever <laughs> wealth has been created just like what happened with microsoft and, yeah. and the entire silicon valley yeah, the u.s is an, unfortunately uh, quite a strong history in terms of antitrust and breaking up uh, yeah, companies yeah, that they're like they too big. Facebook now. Yeah. Again, people wanted Facebook to become so big, so Facebook <laughs> became big. People sure. signed up for it, and now people have yes. a problem with it. Yeah. Well, I just find it idiotic. Yeah. In terms of the Competition Commission, I mean, them having this sort of power, isn't that how does that yeah, measure? I'm not sure how their, power, how their powers are to be exercised. Okay. Um, but yeah, I can. I really think there is an issue with so many regulatory bodies mm. set up and mm. having this kind of power. Yeah. yeah, again, we we, we talk about the, the job, the, the number of unemployed people, but when you have all these regulations, regulatory bodies, for example, are we even surprised that people don't want to risk starting a business in this country? Um, and and we, we know how important SMEs are to the economy, small, medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. It's not, the, the, that's the backbone of the economy, but we keep on making it more and more difficult. We keep discouraging people from entering the economy, and then we're we're shocked at the results. Yeah, and the, the we're, all, uh, <laughs> we're all shocked and surprised. The irony is, collectivists who keep on going on and on about how we should force people to act as a collective and blah blah blah. But the moment you say to them, "Okay, well, we are dependent as a collective on foreign investors," yeah. then all of a sudden they have a problem. But not with that it. kind of collective. Yeah, not, yeah. <laughs> not that kind of corporation, <laughs> which is not necessarily the same as collective. Right, right, right. Sure. But not that yeah. kind. Our kind. Yeah. yeah. See, and it's a thing about um, let's let's contrast anti supporters and apartheid supporters. Mm. I might digress a bit now, but apartheid supporters are like, no, we like freedom, except when the authoritarian authoritarianism suits us. Like yes. on the apartheid, and the anti supporters are like, no, we like we like freedom, mm. and we like the ANC's authoritarianism. Mm. They prefer authoritarianism when it suits them. Yes. And when it when it literally gives them more quote-unquote freedom right. or perceived freedom at the expense of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to remember is what this, for instance, this ruling of the Competition Commission or the report comes down to when mm -hmm. the big retailers, the big four and the malls and whatever mm -hmm. it is, comes down to private property rights. Yes, that's which a good reference point. Yeah. It comes down to private property rights. And if I um, undertake an agreement with you two for two shops, mm -hmm. 
it's my property. I don't owe anybody else the right no. to have their, sh their store on my property. That's not how rights that, work, girls. <laughs> it's, it's period. You, you can like that or not. You can complain about it. You can yes. moan and cry about it. Here, the bottom line is I don't owe you a presence on my property. Mm. So if I want to sign an exclusive agreement with Zakes and mm. with Chris, mm. so be it. Yeah. It's my property. If you don't like it, take your money elsewhere. Mm -hmm. True. It's a yeah. market for a reason, yeah. albeit not a really free market. Well, sure. true. And it, it is a property rights question, and the Commission doesn't even consider that, right? Because no, they sure aren't <laughs> considering the, valid, the validity of these contracts mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a contractual issue, really. Is the contract valid? If it's valid, then there's nothing else to be discussed, really, because no third party should have any bearing whatsoever on what two parties have agreed to. But the Commission doesn't even consider it. It only considers the implications of the implications on these smaller retailers that these contracts have and the 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 danger in that type of thinking is that they will have to consider the implications of each and every contract mm. that what it had or the implications that that those contracts will have on various competitors in various industries and no. it just doesn't make sense i i have a huge gripe with the Com competition commission no. as an institution it is quite contradictory right mm. the best way to enhance competition is by allowing people to be more free no. is by deregulation and no, you don't regulate competition precisely, yeah. and they seem to think that they can regulate the economy to be much more free and competitive no. it is a contradiction in terms <laughs> okay on that uh, that abstract point i think we'll we'll finish there thank you all once again for joining us uh, for watching along and listening to us this week um, just a reminder you can find our work on our website our articles and submissions on www.freemarketfoundation.com. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We've got our respective pages on those platforms. Please like this video, subscribe and share it. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for watching every week and for sharing it. We're getting good views and we really appreciate the support. I uh, hope you have a good uh, weekend and we'll talk to you again next week. Cheers.